Okay, well then, let's get started. Hi, producer John. Good morning. Um, welcome to episode 28. Yes, of the Smart B Sports update, which is a day late because I missed yesterday. Terrible timing. <laughs> you can't, Dan. Good, thanks, John. Uh, yeah, that win by Australia in the World Cup final, just extraordinary. Um, they were long odds to win going into it, and um, I think that's definitely uh, Australia's best Cricket World Cup win for sure of the six. Um, 87, I don't remember, obviously. I was only weeks old when that was on, but... <laughs> Uh, 99, 2003, 2007, I think it's fair to say Australia were clearly the best side. Um, 2015, they were playing at home. I think given the circumstances, the conditions, the opponent, um, this is definitely Australia's greatest definitely. World Cricket World Cup victory. After Indians long, India's going undefeated up till now. Um, oh, that's what I was going to look up, India's... Um Streak, which we'll do it in a minute. Yeah, was it? Well, yeah, well, they won 10 at the World Cup going into it, the, the nine group stage games and the semi final. Um, won all of those, so they won 10 in a row. And for Australia to win, um, j- j- just the circumstances as well, John. I mean, we, we talked about the pitch last week, the, these pitches last week, John. That pitch for the final. It looked like a day five test pitch, John. It was. It had potholes at either end. How do you have a pitch like that for a World Cup final? The pitch should be a nice, clean strip for batting. It shouldn't have. It, it shouldn't look like players have run on it for five days of a test match. Well, and honestly, and and so they've obviously tampered with the pitch again. Um, no, ho- hoping that. that it would suit them, and it's backfired on them because I think if they'd prepared a batting deck. I think they would have won the game. I think they would have outscored Australia. But they've prepared a pitch to suit their spin bowlers and their spin bowlers didn't have an impact. Australia played everything perfectly. Um, Pat Cummins deciding to bowl first. It was a master stroke. I think if if India had a chase um, with the dew that everyone was talking about, it's easier to bat when the dew comes on the ground later on in the night. Um, I think India win that game if they bat second. I think the only way Australia were going to win was by putting India in, and, and it, it was just textbook from Cummins. Perfection, um, a really well-executed win um, at every level for Australia. Yeah, I thought the, everything about the match was perfectly done by Australia. Even the, um, like the, they were just miserly with the ball. Like the, the run rate was ridiculous. So India was, I think it was 4 for 150 at uh, 30 overs, and... Even at that point, yeah, it didn't look like that India was going to make 300. Mm. Um, you know, no, normally you would think they would because you double at 30 overs, you double what, what your current is to get what you're going to get at 50. Yeah. But just, you know, every ball you could assess the run rate and you could see, like, you know, they're going to have to make eight per over to get to 300. They hadn't mm. made eight in and over basically the whole match so mm. far and they didn't look at any time like they were going to. Mm. Um, I think the run rate, like, hung around around 4.6, 4.7 for the entire match. Um, yeah, I watched the up until Australia was two for... I can't remember what it was. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I believe it or not, John, I stayed up for the whole thing. Yeah, I, I stayed up till I found myself a. asleep on the couch. So I just went, yeah, all right, it's time to go to bed. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, Australia did nothing. It was basically the perfect game of cricket from Australia. Mm. Um, they, they didn't need very many batters, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, Australia just took that that Indian batting innings. Australia just took a wicket whenever India, whenever India sort of half looked like getting a partnership going. Australia took a wicket, so Australia just really strangled India out of the game from the start. Um, you're getting India at three for eighty one, and then as soon as Coley looked like he was getting going, Cummins um, knocked him over. And just the, these Indian guns just could... I mean, you know, there were contributions. Rohit Sharma, 47. Kohli, 54. KL Rahul, 66. But that was all. There were no other contributions. Um, so none of them went on to get a big score. And that's what cost India only making 240 from the 50. Yeah, and, um, there was at one point... 
there, it had been, I think, 59 balls since a boundary. Yeah, that's right, John. It was um, just that India couldn't get better. And that, was, that just speaks to the fielding. The, I think um, Manus Labashain, uh, Dave Warner and Adam Zampa um, were, to me, the best on the field. Um, they just they just shut down every single boundary. Just every single time you thought like even a few times during the commentary we were like, Oh there it is and then Dave Warner would come sliding across and bat the ball away. Yeah, just yeah. refused to allow boundaries to come. Um, there were a couple of <laughs> points where they did some silly buggers where they were trying to get the runouts. Um, like I think Glenn Maxwell threw a ball at the wicket for no reason and overshot and gave extra runs and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The, a couple the, of times in a row where they did that couple of overthrows, but that was really the only problem in the field. Yeah. They, they held on to all their catches. They held on to every opportunity. Um, everything had to go right for Australia to win that one, and, and it, it pretty much did, John. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the boundaries hit by India. They only hit four boundaries after the completion of that first power play from overs 1 to 10. So that's the fewest number of boundaries by any team between the 11th and 50th overs in a men's ODI since 2011. So there you go. That's how that's how much Australia strangled them. Only four boundaries after the first 10 overs hit by India. Yeah, it was absolutely ridiculous. Like honestly, like so many times you just thought it's going for a four. Nope. Manus Labashain comes running across. <laughs> yeah. And when they that was like the biggest cheer when they finally got one after I think it was 70 minutes. 72 minutes or something with no boundaries. Finally, they hit a four, and that was like the biggest cheer in like in basically two hours from the Indian crowd. Um, yeah, if I had to numb it down to one moment, John, I think Cummins getting Coley, I think that was the real, that was the point where you thought, you, you could see that look on Coley's face at that dismissal. He just looked completely dejected. That, I reckon Australia would have looked at Coley then and that was when they thought, right, we, we've got him here. Yeah. You, you could see it in their eyes. Um, you could see it in the eyes of the Australians. Um, you could see it in the eyes of the Indians at that point that this was going to be Australia's day. Yeah, and they just they just continued on with it. Like, no... Honestly, um, you know, the bowling rotation was brilliant. Um, I mean... That, I think it's funny because I think Zampa had his second worst game of the series, um, mm. uh, but it didn't make a difference. Uh, he did get one one wicket, right? Um, um, yeah, he. Let me just have a look. Yeah, he did take. He took one for forty four from his ten overs. Yeah, like terrible, terrible stats. Sounds like he's like. Mm. But, yeah, um, but Stark uh, took three for fifty five. Hazelwood two for sixty. Cummins two for thirty four the all-important wicket of Virat Kohli, and Maxwell won for 35 there, John. Yeah. Um, that was, I was watching every time Zampa came in, I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't understand what's going on here. He doesn't look good. But it was the same during the South Africa game, actually. Like, he didn't he didn't look... You know, we discussed last week that it's... Um, uh, we're relying on Adam Zampa too much. It seems like every time we, you, you, every, everybody in the world said anything about the Australian cricket team, the next game they would just show everything you'd said is wrong. Yeah. You know, like we were discussing after the second match that maybe Pat Cummins isn't, isn't able to handle the captaincy. Mm. Uh, and it's not, it wasn't just us, you know, like everybody in the world was saying Pat Cummins couldn't handle the captaincy. Maybe he needs to step down or not bowl or whatever needs to be done. Mm. And then... You know, from then on. <laughs> well, that, that, that's the thing about cricket, isn't it, John? I mean, if, if certain players don't stand up, I mean, others can pick up the slack. Like with the bowling, um, yeah, Stark taking... All right, Tampa had a bit of an off day, only the one wicket, but Stark took three wickets. Cummins took two wickets, including the crucial one of Coley. Hazelwood took two wickets. So others have, have, have picked up the slack there. Same with the batting. Warner failed. Mitch Marsh failed, Steve Smith failed, but then you got Travis Head and Labashain stepping up in yeah. their absence. So, oh, Labashain was phenomenal. So, yeah, so that. when certain players don't fire, it just means others need to pick up the slack, and that's what happened for Australia in that final. You, you talk about Cummins as bowling, John, um, extraordinary performance. We talk about the lack of boundaries for India. Pat Cummins conceded zero boundaries in his 10 overs in that bowling spell. The last fast bowler to bowl his quota of 10 overs without conceding even one boundary in a men's ODI World Cup game was Sean Pollock against England way back in 2007. 
that gives you an idea of 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 how That's you know ridiculous. just just a sensational bowling spell by Cummins. They just could. Couldn't get hold of him at all. Yeah, the Indians. That's just, they really, yeah. They, um, to go back to the South Africa game, and it was the same. Stark three, Pat Cummins three wickets, Josh Hazelwood two, Adam Zampa zero for fifty five. You know, like just before the South African game, we were saying, you know, they, and again, like not just us, everyone in the world was saying, mm. man, Australia's really going to rely on that Adam Zampa to get them over the line here. None of the other guys are in good bowling form, and then they just they just flipped everything on its head. Yeah, um, and it just goes like Travis Head just coming in and hitting a million just goes to show exactly like there is somebody in Australia, the Australian team that can always do that you can never ever count them out because even at three for what was it was Australia got yeah they were three for 47 yeah, at that, that point I don't know good. if you were up at that point no I was out, of, out of, yeah I, I was watching at that at three for 47 I've got to say John I was I was pretty dejected I thought yeah. I thought Australia were going to fall apart at that point I mean um, Steve Smith had got out LBW to Boomerah and he should have reviewed that's the thing if he'd reviewed they, 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 the, the replays found that it hit him outside the line so if he'd reviewed he would have been given not out and at that point I was thinking oh Travis Head why didn't you because for an outside the line you go well I think that's more on the non-striker to pick that up it's hard, very hard for yeah, the batsman facing to, to be aware that they've been hit he outside asked Travis Head Travis Head said that, that's the thing review. at that point I was like oh Travis Head what are you doing but he, he more he just, than made up for it he just obviously. wanted Labashain in for yeah. <laughs> but yeah great effort yeah as I said Warner out for 7 um, Mitch Marsh for 15 and Mitch Marsh sort of winked at the bowler who got him out after as he went off and at that time I was going I don't know if that's the time for jokes, Mitch. But anyway, yeah, and as we said, Steve Smith out for that LBW. But then that Travis Head and, and, uh, and Labashane partnership, just extraordinary, John. Yeah, I think Labashane probably had his <clears throat> best batting. He was he got 58. He had his best batting um, innings of the tournament as well. It wasn't just that he hit, that got them to the half century, but he partnered so well with Travis Head to get exactly what Pat Cummins did with Glenn Maxwell a couple of weeks ago. You know, he was there to make sure that Head, who was just on fire was getting the ball when he needed to and mm. yeah obviously uh, 240 was a, t- a bad uh, such a low target to set but it still it looked like based on the wicket that actually that was it that was all there was available and so 240 I was like man it's, it's low yeah, you, you can still win bowl, bowling to the um, defending that target you can still win if yeah, you bowl well it's low especially but it's, mm, it's not that low in India's bowlers. Yeah. And, and when, when you're 3 for 47, 240 looks like 340. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, yeah, John, you talk, talk about that 40. partnership between Head and, and, and Labuschagne. Um, the 192 runs, that's the second highest in men's ODI World Cup finals behind the unbroken 234-run partnership between Ricky Ponting and Damian Martin for the third wicket against India in that 2003 final, John. So there's a bit of symmetry there. Mm. 2003 final, Australia beat India. The 2023 final, Australia beat India. It's a nice little symmetry there, John. Um, yeah, um, in terms of that, um, that Travis had 137, John. That's the highest while chasing in a men's ODI World Cup final. That surpasses Aravinda De Silva's unbeaten 107 against Australia in 1996. Heads 137 is also the fourth highest individual score in a men's ODI World Cup final, John. That's, yeah, once again, records. <laughs> Just constant yeah, records. Um, there's, a, there's a few more there, John. Um, there were only um, three players before Head to win the Man of the Match award in both the semi-final and the final of the same men's ODI World Cup. The others were Mahinda Amanath in 1983. Aravinda De Silva again gets a mention in 1996. And guess who, John, in 1999, the great Shane Warne. So there you go. Travis Head is in really good company. Um, yeah, the, 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 the numbers keep going, John. 199 runs scored by Head across the semi-finals and final. That's the most by any batter in a men's ODI World Cup. That goes past Viv Richards' 180 runs in the 1979 edition. Um, so there you go. The, 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 the records and numbers just tumbled there, John. Um, yeah. a, a great effort by Australia. And 
Uh, uh, now my, my, you know, leading up to the match, all the Indian guys in the office, like Yash and stuff, they're all gum. You know, I was telling them how India was a bunch of cheats. Of course, they don't accept it. No bias there. Um, and then they were saying, like, what happens if Australia wins then? Did Australia cheat? I was like, no, Australia wins in spite of the cheating. Yeah. <laughs> John, that's what I, I just, I, I mean, so India had a, a, a full house crowd in a 130,000 seat stadium. And there was a guy in a Port Adelaide jersey. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There was, so there were, what, what were there, 130,000 in the crowd. So there were 129,999 Indians and one guy in a Port Adelaide jersey, John. That, 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 that was the breakdown of the crowd. Um, but there you go, John. They had the crowd in their favour. They clearly doctored the pitch again. You should not have a pitch like that in a World Cup final. Yeah. It's got to be a nice batting strip. And if it hadn't been a batting strip, I think India would have won, John. They would have made 400 with that batting lineup, And they would have won. So it's really... Um, well, yeah, they've really... Um, there was a news article... Well, it serves them right, doesn't yeah, exactly. it? They've cheated a... and it's worked against them, the cheating. There was a news article where Pat Cummins went and inspected the pitch um, before the match, as they're, as they're allowed to do, and then he called all the boys down to have a look as well. <laughs> and they yeah. were like, what should we do? Again, great captaincy from Pat Cummins. He went, well, this looks dodge. I better get the boys down. So he called the whole leadership down, leadership team of the, the squad down to have a look at the pitch and make their decision. And at, it was at that point where they decided they would bowl first and just take advantage of basically play India's game. In this, and it was yeah. clear what India yeah. wanted to do. That's it. They beat India at their own and game. And then they went down and went, this is what India wanted to do, so let's just do exactly that. <laughs> and it goes to show how doctoring the pitch actually works. Mm. You know, like it's, if you understand the pitch, then, then you'll win. Um, yeah, it was the only way Australia were going to win, bowling first and restricting yeah. India and then chasing down the total. So, mm. well done to Pat Cummins. Yeah, head 137, Labuschagne 58, not out. Um, great performances from them, John. Um, yeah, so head's actually, with that um, 100, John, so he, he's become the first player to score 200s in men's ICC tournament finals. He scored 163 in the first innings of the World Test Championship final against India earlier in the year, and he's backed that up with another 100 here. Great effort from Travis Head. So we should point out that this this is the, the three, the, the hat-trick of wins for Australia in 2023. World Test Championship final against India, tick. The Ashes, retained, tick. Cricket World Cup, 2023, tick. Well done to Australia, yeah, John. All of it's irrelevant now. We've got to stop talking about the World Cup because there's a, a new series... Starting in two days. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like what the um, hell? Yeah, before we get to that, no, no, I just, just got a couple. I've got a couple more things I can run through for you. So, yeah, you, you talk about. Um, we, we talked about the pitch, John, and so if you can believe, after putting together a pitch like that, India's spinners went wicketless um, in the match. Um, there were only three previous instances of India's spinners going wicketless after bowling fifteen plus. Overs in a men's ODI World Cup game. The spinners had no impact on that yeah. deck, John. It just, it just, you know, um, just the egg is really on India's face after this result. It's just so far, it's to me, it's uh, reminiscent of Parramatta cheating the salary cap and getting two wooden spoons. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Who's the worst cheaters in the world now, India? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if I was Parramatta, I would definitely be making social media posts like, "Is that who's the worst cheaters in the world now?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. Um, sorry, John. Just uh, checking out my notes here. So. Um, that's six men's ODI World Cups won yeah. by Australia. 87, 99, 03, 07, 2015 and 2023. West Indies and India are the next on the list with two titles each. So that dominance that's for never Australia. never going to be taken. Really? So you have to think, so there's one every four years. Uh, the only way that anybody would be able to ca even catch up is for India to win the next four. Like The quickest way would be India to next, win the next four, which is still 16 years away. It's such a... A ridiculous stat when you mm. think about it to have won that many more World Cups than your next tires. It is it's just it can never be caught, even caught. You know, no team and a thousand years in the future, it's just going to stay the same. You know, if the world's still around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so that's that's ten con that ten consecutive wins by India before that loss. That's the first instance of India winning ten consecutive men's ODIs. 
Um, that streak of 10 wins is the third best for any team in a men's ODI World Cup behind Australia's 11 in 2003 and 2007. I mean, a great winning streak, John, but they didn't win the one that mattered. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a, what's, what do they say? It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Does it, Australia, Australia also won from third. Uh, there was a lot of danger in that South Africa game. You know, they were, they were up against it. Yeah. it. It did rain during the South Africa game, and mm-hmm. so I was listening to the commentary and... Um, you know, nobody understands cricket. You've got to know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. But <laughs> it had to get to 20 overs before the Duck- Duckworth-Lewis system kicks in. Um, and it was, I think, you know, in South Africa, they were about, like, eight overs in or something before the first rain break, and that was the big worry because the next day was going to be way worse. <clears throat> but luckily they were the rain stayed away. So that, that was really good to get Australia through to the final and then... Yeah, it was just it was such a cracking game of cricket as well. I mean, maybe I'm biased because Australia won. <laughs> but it was a good game of cricket. Yeah, um, no surprise, Don Travis said, man of the match. And yeah, Virat Kohli, man of the series, but he tried that award in for the oh, one yeah, that mattered, sure. John. So there, there has been a lot of like back and forth um, about you know bad sportsmanship amongst the crowd, the players and so on. The Indian team going inside to... to uh, not stay out for the presentation, like that. That one, I, I, I don't mind to be honest. Like I actually, I know, I, I know how hard it is. Even you know, in um, uh, time, times that I've had to stand on a podium at second, personally, like I don't want to stand there at second. I mean, I, I love all my medals now, but at the time, straight after a match that I've just lost, I don't want to stand there at second. So I can dig that. The crowd, um, that just. I think they were a little bit terrible, to be honest. Um, they're, they're, you know, there's such, there's sore, sore losers and sore uh, winners, and the Indian crowd were definitely sore losers. Uh, they didn't even um, clap when Head got up to his hundred. Mm. I, think, I think the commentary said um, uh, it was like a, a last place Sheffield Shield match. Someone getting to a hundred, like that was the, the noise of the crowd, you know. Mm. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, like uh, yeah, it's not very sporting, is it? Yeah, I think like crowd, a crowd. You know, you get invested in your team and stuff, but crowds need to be better behaved. It doesn't affect them as much as a player. So yeah, like I always understand when a player doesn't want to go out and watch the other team get the award. I totally dig it. <laughs> From personal experience, I don't want to do it either. But you know, the crowd. I'm always, when you're watching, you should always be a little bit better because not you on the field. And then there has been some sore winners, like uh, there's a big outcry now because Pat Cummins is drinking a beer and got his feet up on the, the trophy. Like, it's not a foot rest, bro. <laughs> that thing. Like, yeah. And uh, Dave Warner's done some salty posts about, like, you know, that, that's always going to happen. I swear, like, no matter how much people say that cricket is a gentleman's sport, actually, I think all of them are a bit bit knobby. <laughs> <laughs> like, all of them. Yeah. Every play. You have to be to play cricket. You have to have that arrogance and, and not a bit knobbiness. I've never yeah. seen a, a good winner in cricket, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I didn't like how India walked off without, um, you know, w- w- th- they should have stayed there and waited for the, the presentation. They should have shown the respect to Australia to just, I mean, I know they shook hands with them, but that's to be expected. To just walk off after that and not, you know, I thought they should have been there for Australia receiving their medals and holding up the trophy. you just got to suck that up, John. Oh, it's that's so just hard. But they, 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 they walked off, John. They, they, they weren't happy. I really wonder what would have happened if Australia had a loss. That's, that's what I always think when it comes down to the teams as well. Like, what would have happened if the, if the situation was reversed? Like, would Australia have walked off? Based on the behaviour of Australia winning, I reckon they would have too. Because, <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, cricket is not a gentleman's sport. I don't care what anyone says. Like, it's just full of, like, arrogant, you know, sore winners, sore losers all over the shop. Um... But yeah, like there's there's another series so quickly after mm-hmm. the World Cup. I can't understand who scheduled this and why. There's a T20 series mm-hmm. um, starting on Friday at mm-hmm. it's twelve thirty a.m. our time because mm-hmm. obviously um, T20s are all night games. So, mm. um, but yeah. luckily they only go for a couple of hours. So if you really wanted to watch, you could stay up to three thirty. But who the hell wants to watch? It's a five. It's a five-game series, John, and um, it's a real. You know, the, the, this is where cricket just sort of lacks the feel, doesn't? You've just had the, and I know it's a different format of the game, but you've just had the World Cup final. 
You don't then go and play a five-game series after it. It's um, Argentina and France played in the Soccer World Cup final last year, John. Do you think they played a five-game series after the final? Like f- it doesn't happen, five John. Five days after? South Africa and New Zealand played in the Rugby World Cup <laughs> final only weeks ago. And... They didn't play in a five-game series yeah, after didn't, the final. Like South draw. Africa didn't go out and play a what's it a, a nine nine series? Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 come on, you know. It's so um, bizarre, and it's, it's just, just basically the same squads. Like basically, yeah. That I don't, I can't see them making any changes. So yeah. it's these guys aren't going to get a chance to celebrate, and it's I can, I have a feeling this is going to be a bitter bitter series. Uh, I don't. I think India will be smarting from the World Cup, and that's what will make it interesting. Yeah, but um, we just we just don't need to see it, yeah, do we, John? We, we we've seen the we've had a great it's a great cricket World Cup. We've just had the final. We we, we need to take a bit of a breather after that. We don't need to see this five game twenty twenty series after it. And John, I think there's now that the World Cup's over, we can go into it a little bit deeper. But I think in terms of Obviously, the cricket calendar needs to be cut back, John. It's just overkill. There's just far too many games on. I think a good start, and it's not the only thing I would do, but a good start, and look, it's never going to happen. There's too much money in it. But ideal world scenario for me, John, is 50 over Cricket World Cup. That's your only ODIs. Make it like an Olympic event. You play that once every four years. Imagine how, how big it will become if there's only... it would be like the Ol- Cricket's Olympics mm. once every four years. And now that 2020 cricket is coming into the Olympics, John, as of 2028 in Los Angeles, that can be the international 2020 cricket prize, the, the Olympic gold medal. That, that You can just... that That's the only international 50 over and 20 over cricket you need. Then you've obviously still got all this franchise 2020 cricket, the IPL, the Big Bash. So there's, there's no shortage of 2020 international cricket. Sorry, 2020 cricket, not international yeah. cricket. That's what I meant to well, say. Well, all, all using the same players. Yeah, so <laughs> you've got plenty of 2020 franchise cricket going on. To run test cricket, the 2020 franchise cricket, and just have the only 50 over matches are the ODI World Cup once every four years. That's what I would do to clear a lot of the junk out of the international cricket well, is calendar. Is the um, World Cup always October, November? No, when it was in England in 2019, it was in the middle of the year, I believe. Oh. Um, yeah, so... Um, could they I, could... I just think that's, that's two things you could do straight off the bat that would clear a lot of, as I said, a lot of the junk out of the cricket calendar. Well, I think that not scheduling a 20, 2020 uh, series with two World Cup participants five days, six days after a World Cup final. Yeah, that, that, that'd be a good start, that's, wouldn't it? That, a good start. Tick, we've cleared yeah, that yeah, one. That's, Let's that's, prove that's, that. That's five games you could easily take. So there's the ten schedule. teams in the um, World Cup. And like it's 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 like you have a list mm. of of teams that shouldn't be doing series for a little while afterwards. Like, <laughs> yeah, like come on, it's just it's just a bizarre yeah, thing. Just, just yeah, as I say, your international fifty over cricket, just the ODI World Cup every four years, once yeah. every four years. International twenty twenty cricket now, just the Olympic Games. That's it, and you would add a lot more, and those prizes would be made bigger. The fact that they have this series so soon after the ODI World Cup, in a, in a certain way, it sort of devalues the World Cup a little bit because, oh, we've got five more games after it. It's bizarre. Give it, give it context. Give it relevance. Um, they've got um, things like the Champions Trophy, Asia Cup, stuff like that, that are also there um, for ODIs. You know, like, I can... Like, They'll say it's hard to to cut down the amount of AD, ODIs. Well, not the amount of ODIs, but they'll say it's hard to cut down simply because the players have to find form and be in form and play but, ODI. But you, you only need to do that in the lead up to the yeah, World Cup, though. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You could just do that. I mean, there are other tournaments that exist, like the Champions Trophy and the Asia Cup. Um, I can't think of any others, to be honest. <laughs> but they, they can still exist in their own own realm as well, you know. You could have a... They could do something like having a ODI tournament even at the extreme every year, where it is something like that. Like you have the Champions Trophy, which is the top eight ranked teams from the World Cup two years after. They have the Asia Cup, which is purely basically a... Um, 
it's meant to be growing the the quality of the teams in the subcontinent Asian subcontinent area, but obviously India just dominate it and make all the decisions because the BCCI controls mm. everything. Um, you know there are things that they could do, but yeah, you should not not in any sport be having a series six days after. Yeah. The sport, the it's, World Cup finishes. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like all um, the, after the um, earlier this year, they had the um, the women's soccer World Cup, women's World Cup, um, and all of the players went back to their respective teams, and then they now they have uh, Olympic qualifiers going on. Um, but it's, it wasn't like it's never like with with soccer because obviously soccer runs the best World Cup. Men's or women's, it runs the best World Cup. It runs the because it's popular. the only truly, genuinely yeah. world game. So you, you, everybody should be following what they do, and one of the things they don't, and what they do, and what they don't do, and one of the things they don't do is have weird, friendly, uh, you know, test series five days after the mm-hmm. end of the World Cup. At the end of the World Cup, there were no internationals for any of the teams that were in the World Cup for like a month, and then the Olympic qualifiers had to start, and. You know, I don't. I don't know who organises these these things. Is it the ICC? Is it the BCCI and Cricket Australia working together or whatever? But you have to say at some point, like the BCCI and Cricket Australia and even the ICC should have sat down or looked at it and went, you know what? Maybe it's not really like a thing we should do five days after World Cup finishes. Yeah, <laughs> like it's it's. it's- it's a bizarre thing. The bizarre that, 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 that's the problem with cricket. They just look at it. They, they look at that and go, "Oh, we can make some easy cash out of this." It's not always about the money, is it, John? No. You know, you have to think about relevance, context, and and, and overkill as well. I'd like to see the crowd. I can't wait to see the crowd numbers. But anyway, it's it's on. Um, yeah. What day? Uh, it starts on Friday, twelve thirty a.m. I forgot to do my elite bet. Elite bet. Elite bet. All of our odds in November are brought to you by Elite Bet. All bookmakers claim to offer service sub description, but Elite Bet, they generally provide themselves on offering exceptional personal service that is not found in the bookmaking industry. They are an Australian owned business where old fashioned customer service really matters. EliteBet.com.au. Can, can I, Bet with your head, not over it. I just got a couple more things on cricket before. No, we're not moving on for cricket because I've got to give odds on um, that this series. So the next, okay, yeah. this, this yeah. game, well, this match, the next match is even, $1.90 each way. Um, How would you know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't know, is India going to doctor the pitch as much as uh, are they, you know, like it's T20. Yeah, I think up. in T20, the... There's never a pitch doctor. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing. The the the, the shorter the game, the less impact yeah, the pitch doctor exactly. can have. So, uh, yeah, like a dollar ninety is pretty accurate odds to me. Um, as I said, I reckon the best thing that's going to come out of this is all of the news, uh, which we'll bring every week, uh, all of the news of the bitterness and anger, anger and, and more the drama. It's going to be WWE drama rather than any interest in the actual matches. I'm sure yeah. there'll be like some great soap opera style drama around, yeah. you know, Virat Kohli's going to oh. do something rude, Dave Warner, or I don't know if Dave Warner would play, but, you know, somebody will do I, something, Mitch Mars will do something rude. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, I haven't had a chance to look at squads for this series. Do I think know? it's basically the same. Right, okay. It's basically the same. Because um, um, I, I would have thought um, that Astra- after Australia's triumph that they just rest a whole bunch of players from that series and not care about it at all. Yeah, why would anyone care? Um, yeah, so Australia has, yeah, Dave Warner, Steve Smith, Tim David, Travis Head, Glenn Maxwell, Ma- Stoinis, Matt Short, Josh Inglis, Matt Wade, Jason Berendorf, Nathan. So there are some players out. Sean Abbott, Spencer Johnson, Tanvi Sanger. Um, okay, sounds like the, the pace attack bowlers have been given a rest then. Sounds yeah. like no Cummins, no Stark, no Hazelwood. The, oh, and the in India is... Well, they've, yeah, they've rested everyone. So India is uh, Rinku Singh, Rod- uh, forgive me for the pronunciations, Rodaraj Gaikwad, Surikama, Kuma Yadav is the captain, Tilak Varma, Yashasvi, Jaswell, Aksar Patel, Shivam Dube, Washington Sundar, Ishan Kishan, Jitesh Sharma, Ashdeep Singh, Avesh Khan, Mukesh Kumar, Prasid Krishna and Ravi Bishnoi. None of the big guns. No, is, is that right, John, that for Australia, no Cummins, Hazelwood or Stark? Is that right? Yep, yep. Yeah, yep. okay. Yep, it's all um, spin, 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 yep. spin, spin. Um, yeah, and a few of the fast mediums, like lower, lower level ones. Anyway, but yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, I'm, mm. I'm really interested in the drama. 
Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the drama yeah. for this one. I, like, I won't watch any of the matches. I'll probably watch highlights the next day and stuff like that. But I'm not going to stay up to 12.30 or 3.30 to watch it. But I'm sure there will be drama. Mm. I'm 100% certain. And that that'll keep me engaged. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, more cricket news. Yeah, um, I was just going to mention just a couple of things, John. Um, did you... So you watched a fair bit of the final? I'm yeah, sure yeah, I think that was like t- two for 40 I went to bed. It was the kind of thing oh. where I'd, I'd found myself asleep and woke up and looked at the score and went, oh, I'm off to bed. What What do you think of the... Did you like the commentary? Were you... What do you think of the commentary? It was super biased, which is always going to happen. Mm. Um, but to be honest, I tuned out. Um, like, just wasn't paying that much attention and paid attention to my own thoughts instead yeah. because it was super... Like, it wasn't... I, I, don't, I don't know why they didn't get the best possible personalities they could. It seemed like they got the B team in... in I just... I just got to say, John, sometimes I think, should I say this or not? Sometimes I just can't help myself. John, that Matthew Hayden's commentary was just cringeworthy to me. Just over the... And I know the win was great at the end, but for the whole match, the match goes for 100 overs. Early on in the match, he's commentating like it's, you know, right at the end and a thrilling finish, just not understanding not seeming to understand that, you know, you need to tone it down sometimes with your commentary. You can't be up all the time and excited all the time. It was just, it was just, it was just painful. I've got to be, it was just painful to listen to. It was like pulling your teeth out. Yeah, I tuned, like I said, I tuned it out. I paid zero attention to what they were saying in the end. I found the Indian commentators to be really biased towards India. I found the Australian commentators to be really biased towards Australia. Um, There was no, no good banter. Which is one so, of the you know, in no cricket, banter. in cricket especially because look fifty fifty is ODIs are shorter but there's a lot of long periods of time where like nothing interesting is happening and what you're there to do is listen to the banter the conversations between it's not like rugby league or AFL or tennis or tennis that have commentary during the points but where things are like constantly happening like MMA things are constantly happening so. They can't actually stop and converse with each other, tell interesting stories. Um, you know, you've brought them up a few times, like um, Ricky Ponting telling interesting stories about Shane Warne and things like that. That can happen in cricket because it doesn't matter what format it is, except maybe 2020. There are periods of time where nothing really interesting is happening, mm. right? Mm. So you can get that's what you want out of cricket. But what I what I found was it was just just boring, actually. The, yeah, boring. And you know Hayden wasn't the only one. I thought Shane Watson was so boring as well. And the, the, it's just, but uh, whereas the the pregame show on Fox, you had Kerry O'Keefe, who's great, entertaining, yeah. insightful. You had Mark War, who's great as well. Calls it as he sees it, gives strong opinions. Brad Haddon as well, I think, is really good. That was a really good panel show they had. But then you got to the actual game itself. And it was just really bland, a lot of the commentary. Ricky Ponting, I thought, was really good. He's a sensational commentator. But just Hayden and Watson, John, you know, just... Yeah, but... Um, it, 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 just, it just sounded really B-grade and really average to me. Ricky like, Ponting, be honest Ricky about Ponting being good when surrounded by a bunch of uh, less good people is like Nathan Merritt being the top try scorer in a <laughs> team, man. Like, that's what it was like to me. But I, I honestly, like, tuned it out completely. Uh, I had it on just for the noise, um, but it was like down low. I was like scrolling on my phone. Um, I, I, I would love a button on the TV where you can turn off the commentary and still have the crowd noise, so you get that atmosphere of the. There effect. is some. Oh, I'm trying to. That, that's soccer. Mode. It's called soccer mode and things like that. There are some. I don't know about now, but back in the olden days, you used to have these kind of like alternate commentary things on the Foxtel, the old Foxtel remote. You could. You could change to these kind of different things where it, one of them was crowd crowd instead of commentary and I remember there was one that was um, for some sports they had like um, guest commentators that were just rando guys mm. and they'd be terrible but like funny to listen to mm. you know there's, there's times in my life where I've completely turned off commentary and it's kind of hard now because of the mixed the delays but there, you know I used to put Roy and HG on the radio and watch mm. the game on Channel 9. Mm. Um, when Ray Hadley played, uh, commentated for Channel 9, 
I, I would I would literally like have the volume off. I, I couldn't stand it at all. Uh, I think you know that's one of the biggest travesties in the history of world sport. Channel Nine firing Andrew Voss and keeping Ray Hadley as a commentator. Um, yeah, like you know there there are these extremes. Um, but yeah, like now it's really difficult to to cross the get the timing right on. But you know you have digital radio, so you can fast forward rewind. You have digital TV, so you can fast forward rewind. You can try and get your match up, but one of the things I found is like because the ads are different, it's mm. you can't match them up. So mm. yeah, it's 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 kind of annoying uh, that you don't have these options anymore. There was an app uh, called Hijack TV. Um, I don't know if it's still around. I might have to look it up. Where it was crowdsourced commentary, and I listened to the grand final. Uh, NRL grand final once on Hijack TV instead of listening to the commentary. Mm. Uh, it, was, it was difficult to get the the timing to line up, but they had functions to get the timing to line up. And um, one of the things I found is the guys that I was listening to were watching it on Channel 9, and I was watching it on 9 Now, the the app, because I don't have an antenna at my house. I only watch through internet TV, right? And it was heaps funny because I was also at the time chatting to my friends on WhatsApp. Um, it was during COVID as well, like no one was allowed to have parties and stuff. And I said to them at one point, like, are you guys fully sick of these Diablo ads? And they replied, like, what Diablo ads? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, because even on the, the streaming one, it's completely different ads to what's on TV and they mm. don't cross match up. Mm. So what was happening, like, every, like, 10 minutes or so, uh, my Hijack TV commentary would get, like, two to three seconds out and I'd just have to push a button on Hijack TV to, like, manually catch it up again. And that was really good. It made the, like, that was, you know... Uh, I didn't like the commentators that were commentating the rugby league, to be honest. Um, like, I don't like watching rugby league grand final with Phil Gould commentating and things like that. So, um, yeah, like, that, that was that was a good option, but I don't know if they exist anymore. I don't know if things like that exist anymore. My TV has a thing called soccer mode where I can change the... I was like, no, my old TV had a thing called soccer mode. I'd always accidentally push the button. And it would have these commentary buttons, but... The problem with it was is in Australia, it didn't um, conform to, like, the Australian A-League. It didn't have the A-League button functions. It was for overseas functions, like overseas leagues. So the buttons actually did nothing. Once you entered soccer mode, <laughs> you couldn't do anything. Mm. Um, but, yeah, like, I, I really... These are the kind of things that would be awesome for people. It's the same as a few years ago. I remember Telstra wanted to add, like... Um, uh, promoted stats in game because you know all of the rugby league players wear the GPS trackers. They wanted to put promoted stats in the game, and that's like a cool thing to look at. You know, like ongoing stats, like how fast did this guy run, how hard did this ball go, and you get them based on like the organisation. So in cricket, we always get the speed of the ball. Sometimes we get the angles and things like that. Mm. But having something like oh, you know, Travis Head's heart rate was really up on on that mat that that ball mm. would be awesome yeah and then it's an insight yeah you know? it's so, yeah. Like, something cool that would like and yeah. you know what they wanted to do like when it was like thrown about was have like a button on your foxtel or whatever that like basically re- you were able to play with the stats and choose what you wanted to see mm. during the match and then of course the clubs and certain stuff and no no because it gives way too much insight into players actually i could Again, I can understand that. You don't want to know that Wade Graham is cramping or something based on his... <laughs> or, yeah. or Addo Carr is down by an average of five kilometres an hour on a sprint or something, you know, that kind of thing. But, like, all of these kind of things is, like, should be the future of television. It should be the future of watching, you know. It should be I have multiple commentary um, uh, options. It should be I have multiple different ways to look at stats and things like that, like... You know, I only want to watch what's going on with the bowlers for this over. Mm. I only want to watch what's going on with the batters for this over and stuff like that. Um, it'd be really cool, but... And it's the technology is there. The technology is possible. They just don't do it. Yeah, um, R- Richie Benno, the great Richie Benno, um, he used to say, if you're commentating, you should not say what's happening on the monitor. You should add to what's happening on the monitor. Yeah. I think he summed it up perfectly with that, John. To just say, say something like, "Oh, that that that's a great shot by Travis." He's like, "Yeah, we know it's a great yeah, shot by it. Travis." <laughs> you, you don't you don't need to tell us that. Give us an insight. Tell us something we don't know. You get that from Ponting all the time. Um, I just thought, yeah, Hayden and Watson in particular, John. I just thought it was, 
I thought it was a really B grade substandard commentary performance, and I, it was it was just boring. It was so boring. Yeah, and that's uh, like, you, you got to do but to just raise your voice and say, "Oh, well, what a cracking shot!" Or oh, that was a great ball. No, no, no. You're getting paid really good money. You, you got to produce better than that. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's yeah. I it was super boring to me. All the commentary was super boring to me. I just didn't want to yeah. watch any. Yeah, and, and 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 sometimes. I'd rather them not say anything for a few balls. Don't feel like you have to say something all the time. Go a few balls without saying a word. If you don't have anything productive to say, you're better off not saying anything. Yeah. Just providing... I'd rather two pieces of insight in and over so telling me something that I don't know than six comments after every ball that, that are meaningless, yeah. that, that tell me nothing. Well, uh, yeah, like... Uh, you know, the other thing is radio commentary is different to television commentary and because they were the television commentators it's a very different kind mm. of ball game you know like radio commentary they have to tell you everything you know they have to basically they only have room to tell you like you know Travis Head just hit a one um, now this guy's bowling and yeah. so on because you can't see it but on television I can see it yeah like I can yeah, see exactly. what's happening you can see it I don't, I don't need to uh, you know one of the things about radio commentary is they constantly have to say the score they, they really like you can tell inexperienced yeah, well, radio yeah. commentators well, they've got to be more descriptive they've got yeah. no choice you can't but say with television going commentary on. you never have to say the score because the score is always on the screen the score's there so it's a bit weird sometimes even when I'm watching television commentary especially in cricket where they'll go and now it's 4 for 11 like yeah I know man yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can read <laughs> like, yeah. so yeah why say it it's yeah. there on the screen and so that's that's the fine line the best commentators do exactly what you're talking about they add to what what is happening on the screen? They don't tell you what's happening on the screen. So yeah, it was it was I, dull. I, would... I just feel like a lot of TV stations are very complacent with that sort of thing. They probably look at the ratings and go, "Oh, it rated well, so it's sweet." Because yeah, we don't have any other choice. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just just because it rates well doesn't mean that y your commentary is of very high quality. What? That, that they could do a lot to improve in, in that area. I would have thought. Yeah, Tom. well, and that's because that what that comment commentators actually do is bring people who are not interested or as interested in your sport into your sport. Yeah. You know, like the, the colour commentary yeah. and the play-by-play -play working together. People who aren't that interested will, will find it entertaining based on the yep. commentary, right? Th three if, yeah, three categories of people. People who will always watch it, people who might or might not, people who will never watch it. You need to get the people in that middle category. Yeah, They're exactly. the ones you're targeting. And you do that with good commentary. Yeah, 100%. Um, because yeah. people who might or might not watch a game of cricket is a game of cricket. Mm. You know, they want Australia to win, but they don't know what's going on. They don't know what it means with the different balls. They don't want to flash it up with this guy's on the offside, this guy's on the whatever. They don't know what it means, but they want the commentators to explain it in an entertaining and insightful way. Not just say, uh, he's, he's on the run off, run up. Yep, they, he's and they, they, get, they get paid really good money as well, John. And then he's hit it. And then now he's on the run up again. They th it's almost <laughs> like they think that well, we're stupid and we don't notice these things. I mean, we notice. We have to listen to it for. for I, I watched that game went for eight hours the other night. I, I, I watched every ball. I, I listened to all of it. You pick these things up over that amount of time as the viewer. The viewers are not stupid. I think they need to be treated with more respect by these TV stations. John. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, anyway, yeah, I, th I just thought that was no, interesting. It's, it is like, and this, you see in other other. Other sports, other um, uh, matches. And that's like one of the things you see is, is if the ratings drop when they replace the commentator, they get rid of that commentator. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, I don't think they put their A team in place. You know, <laughs> that was the thing. I think they put like a B team, and it was the biggest match. One good thing that came out of it was the crowd was actually full. You know, but lead, like all the all the matches leading up to yeah, that. that's why I would have been happy turning <laughs> off the commentary and just hearing the crowd. I'll... But it went silent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there like was the... actually there was a lot of silence yeah, though, after yes. like the thirty fifth over. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, you can watch the T twenty if you want, but who cares? Um, uh, we do have a winner for our cricket comp. Mm -hmm. um, we ran it. So uh, congratulations, Alan Wood who signed up uh, to win the cricket comp, uh, will be contacting you via your email um, and getting your address and stuff to ship you out your Jacobs Creek pack with a Kookaburra Shadow 2 Bat Beach Cricket Pack, bunch of wines. Uh, what was the thing called, John Manners? Uh, Producer John? 
decanter. A decanter. Really sure. Yeah, we'll call it a decanter. <laughs> uh, the ice bucket, the hats, uh, all the fun stuff. So that'll come to you soon. Well done, Alan Wood. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. With that, we'll move on to rugby league. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Michael Maguire is or is he, will they or won't they? <laughs> the um, ultimate rom- rom-com. Um, will he coach New South Wales or not? It's hey, Time's moving on. There's only six months to Origin kick off. <laughs> it, it seems, John, like um, this push to have Maguire as the New South Wales coach, it's got New Zealand's noses out of joint now, John. Yeah. So now they... R- reports um, indicate that they're considering sacking Maguire. There's a push from some ex-players of New Zealand. Um, I'm just having a look here at what um, which players they were. Uh, it was Stacey Jones, uh, Adam Blair maybe was one of them. You yeah, should probably check before I just start spouting off names. Um, oh, sorry, I think Kalis and Stacey Jones, they're being viewed as potential options to take over but I don't know if they're I'm not sure if they're but, um, but I think there is a push for some ex, from some ex-players they're worried about they think that if he's the New South Wales State of Origin coach as well well in that role he's sort of he's helping the development of Australian players in that that's role that's what I and said so, yeah, so, yeah exactly so they're, they're concerned that's about that's how it that. should be that's so who that's, should be worried about so that's this is an issue that, as you said that we spoke about a number of, or only a couple of weeks ago I think Joel so now this is becoming an issue. This is starting to get messy and, you know, it, it could end up in Maguire having to relinquish his New Zealand coaching job. I just hope that if he has to do that, that he gets a good enough deal from New South Wales to make it worth his while, John. It better be a full-time job. Uh, and that's when yes. it should be the two-year yes. two contract. Um, uh yeah, that's they, they're the only. Like I said, New Zealand is the only people who should care. New South Wales shouldn't care if he coaches New Zealand, but New Zealand should care if he coaches New South Wales. You know, mm-hmm. um, like he, but he did just win. <laughs> you know, so it's, that's it's the thing. hard that, sacking, that, and and he won a final that he wasn't supposed to win, and he won it comprehensively. Yeah. So his stocks are at an all time high at the moment. That's what New Zealand have to bear in mind. Do you really? Look at getting rid of someone whose stocks are that high and who's... He, he coached New Zealand to a 30-0 win over Australia in a tournament final. Um, you no, know, that, 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 is, that is a huge feather in his yeah, cap. Not only was it like a massive win, it was like they kept Australia to nil. Um, but yes, New Zealand should be the... New Zealand ex-players, New Zealand current players, New Zealand staff, New Zealand everyone should be the ones that are worried because him going to... Not just because of the, I think I said it before, not just because of the fact that he's building up Australia, but because some New Zealanders qualify for both teams. Mm-hmm. Some. And Michael Maguire's relationship with some of those New Zealanders could make him want to weigh them into the South, the state of origin Australia side. Mm. For, because we'll get to Paul and his comments later, but social media comments later, but. State of, a state of origin win is still bigger and better, especially for New South Wales, like a bigger, better notoriety type thing than winning with Australia or winning with New Zealand. Even New Zealand beating um, Australia in a Pacific Championship, apparently they're playing it again next year, just so you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, I'm jumping out of my yeah, skin. I can't, I can't wait. They obviously didn't learn. But um, winning state of origin, whether you're Queensland or New South Wales, is still bigger than New, mm. New Zealand beating Australia in the Pacific mm. boring ship. Um, mm. and, and, you know, when he's at New South Wales, there's a lot of players where he could go, ah, oh, you know, I know i got New Zealand Pacific Championship at the end of the year, but that guy also could play for New South Wales and oh, I want to get him into the New South Wales team. Oh, I'll, I'll try and convince him to go to the New South Wales team. And then that opens him up for Australia. That One of the things that players like that need to realise, though, is... If they go to New South Wales, it doesn't necessarily mean they are going to play for Australia, mm. and that means they definitely can't play for New Zealand. Mm. You know, so that's that is the big danger. That's what all New Zealand should be worried about. Mm. I have no idea about Michael Maguire's personality. He's you know, it um, doesn't matter what kind of guy he is because absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
if his job is on the line, y- you never know what people will do. Yeah, so. um, and John, I think that's the only hold up here with him being appointed New South Wales coach. This messy situation with the um, the NZRL trying to resolve this situation. They're just, I think, New South Wales just out of respect to the NZRL. They're just waiting for that to be sorted out before they make I mean, the announcement. They should move on, to be honest, because yeah, six months till Origin kick off. We don't even have a coach. It's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Find someone else. Go to New Zealand Rugby League, say this is how we're going to change the eligibility rules, whatever they need to do to resolve this and, and get him working because he's still got to hire his assistants. He's still got to work out, you know, where they're going to do their camps, all that kind of stuff. He's still got to be looking at the emerging players. Mm. He's still got to be talking to coaches and players and seeing where players are at at the beginning of the season. He's got to know now where Latrell is. You know, what, how is Latrell travelling? What is Latrell doing? Um, and that Latrell is just one of many. Where is Ado Car at? What's Ado Car doing? He's got to know now so he can start making his plans for the future. Know if Latrell is, is looking out of shape. You know, I know it's December and we haven't started, but it's only two months until trials. <laughs> I mean, it comes with, there's barely any off season anymore, is there? Yeah, exactly. by, the time, by the time you get to the end of the international season, um, John, pretty much as soon as the Australian Open tennis ends, the footy's on. The, the, yeah. tri- the trials are on. And, and they're televised now, again. you know. Yeah. So they're more important that, now that, than they ever were before. That's the thing. So the eyeballs are on it right from the start. I think, um, like, uh, the ch- because Dragons so very, like, People think, oh, it's a long off-season. It's not really, John. Um, like the Dragons announced their, um, their trials. Um... So the Charity Shield, obviously, is one of them. They're only having two trials. Um, uh, so it was... Sorry, I've just got to look this up. Oh, come on. It was right at the beginning of February is what I, what I remember, you know. Like, um, the, the, yeah, the trials start basically beginning of February. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, it's going to be like a... Mm-hmm. Uh, no time, but he's got to start looking at players. He's got to he's got to know what he's doing. Mm. He has to plot the downfall of Billy Slater's Queensland, mm. um, February seventeen. So you know that's only ten weeks away. It's mm. less than three months. Mm. <laughs> it's hard to comes around quickly. Yeah. John, the off season's very short these days. So they they need to sort it out. They need to either should I get off the pot? Um, New Zealand Rugby League needs to get shit or get off the pot or get off the pot or shit. Um, New South Wales needs to know what they're doing. I mean, like, it's coming up to Christmas, everyone will be on holidays, but he's still got to be working now. He's still got to be finding out from... Players are back at training. A lot of the coaches know, mainly junior players are back at training, but even, you know, like I said before, all the Dragon seniors are back at training, at training as well. So he's got to know, like, even... Where's Ben Hunt at? What's going on with Ben Hunt? Is he is he is he fit? Is he firing? Is he is he pumped? Is he going to be down on form next year? Do I have to plot for a different hooker to appear in? Harry Grant will be the main hooker and stuff like that. Like that's what a state of origin coach does, and it takes all year. Yeah, I'd imagine that Billy Slater's success as as Queensland coach um, that 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 didn't he didn't just turn up um, on the night of his first game. That that, that it, no. and, and it happened for him. It, it, Months of planning went went into it, and 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 it, it was well, you know, Billy Slater's, um, you know, um, I guess picking a part of New South Wales, and um, I guess his execution of the demise of New South Wales, very similar to Pat Cummins' execution of the demise of India the other night. Took time to work, you yeah. Know? And, and do you, understanding. Do you, think, do you think Pat Cummins just a couple of days before the final just you know put all that together? That, that, that they would have pl- they would have. They would have had that in the works months earlier. They would have yeah. thought, well, if we happen to play India, this is what we're going to do. They wouldn't have just gone, oh, we're playing against India. Let's just hatch together a quick plan overnight. No, no. It's, the, it's these like, things, are. it takes a long time. You, um, the date now? You've got, to, you've got to do very detailed analysis of every player. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, far too much work for just, oh, we've got a couple of days before the final. Let's piece it all I together. Would, if I was them, I'd, I'd set a de- hard deadline, not on Michael Maguire, but on New, Ze- New Zealand Rugby League, and that would get, get Michael Maguire to make his decision mm. and say, like, you know, by the end of this week, 
it's got to be done and dusted or we're moving on to John Cartwright. You know, like that's 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 basically. Yeah, I mean, you get to a point where you need to make a deadline. Yeah. You need a. You need a. Otherwise, a we're just going to lose again. Made. And nobody wants to see New South Wales lose three times in a row. Billy Slater's <laughs> just so smart as a coach. Um, going up against him and that Queensland side, it's no easy task, he John. And you, you need to know what you're doing. You have to dot your eyes and cross yeah. your t's. He should take over from Malmeninga just so we we have someone worse come in. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's it's such a danger to lose. It's three well, that, that's the difference between Billy Slater and Mel Meninga as a coach. Mel, Mel Meninga just coaches teams that you know are high, uh, with all the best players who are you know. When Mel Meninga coached Queensland, um, Queensland had clearly the better team than New yeah. South Wales. And for most, all Mel Meninga's coaching Australia. Any Australian coach clearly has the better team, and he still got beaten. When Billy Slater took over Queensland, that, that, that they were going nowhere, John. Brad Fittler had New South Wales in a good spot at that time. Billy Slater's taken over and he's completely turned yeah, that yeah. on its head. He's built the team. He yeah. took time. Yeah. You know, he's taken yeah. time. That guy is definitely working basically 24, hour days, 24 yeah. hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, yeah. checking in on players, checking in on his coaching allies, checking in on like opposing players, like everything. Um, and, yeah, New South Wales is behind the eight ball again. You know, it's just terrible. Yeah, well, that's the difference between coaching a team that has all the best players and is expected to win and coaching a team that's that's under the pump, that's um, had a, a bit of a run of defeats and you take over and you've got to turn it on its head yourself and you, um, you've got to make an impact yourself and, and be the difference yourself as coach. Yeah. And that's what Slater's done. Yeah. Um, yeah so hopefully that gets resolved really soon. Um, I mean... Mm. It's always a, a will they won't they uh, television show with a love triangle is always interesting in a in a teen drama, but not, yes. not, not in rugby yes. league. Um, so we've got a Jerome Luai update. Yeah, um, apparently Benji Marshall um, made a secret visit to his house, according to reports. In secret a to secret to, to, to <laughs> secret that, that's happened to be reported. Um, yeah, so that's that's an interesting development, John. Um, what actually interested me in reading about this, John, was the quotes from Ivan Cleary about Luai. They're actually a bit sort of spicy, John. This is clear what Cleary said, and I quote, talking about, you know, Luai taking over as the chief playmaker at another team. He's not at Penrith with Cleary yep. there, obviously. Cleary says, Ivan Cleary said, is he ready for that? That's a question mark, I would think. Can he do it? I'm sure he could do it. Has he done it? He hasn't really. In this team, he has his role to play, talking about Penrith, obviously. That's a risk everyone would have to take. In response, Luai took to Instagram posting, know your worth. Mm, so so that's, that's very interesting to me, John. I got some inside information. Oh, yeah. um, apparently, the hold-up with Jerome Luai signing with most teams is... He wants to transition not just to be a chief playmaker, but also to be a number seven. So he'll get his hands on the ball more. And he'll get that at the Tigers if he um, goes there. That's one thing he'll get. Man, they could put, like, call Paul Siren and back to play halfback and it'd be better than what the Tigers currently have. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, um, so one thing that's interesting about it, as well as, you know, uh, Shane Flanagan has said Kyle Flanagan will play six. To Ben Hunt's seven at the Dragons, um, and you know Ben Hunt obviously wants out. We know, um, so there's a seven spot there. Really, if you think about it, there's actually a seven spot there at the Dragons for Jerome Luai. Now, what I got the other day from the Bulldogs was there's no seven spot at the Bulldogs for Jerome Luai. They have their seven. I don't know who their seven is. They wouldn't tell me. <laughs> Well, I mean, Toby Sexton's there at the moment, and John, you'd have Lou I over Toby Sexton yeah, I don't any think day. That, that's what I mean. But I yeah, don't think we, it's we don't. Toby. Obviously, it's someone we don't know yeah. who they're planning. They've still got a lot more signings that they're going to announce as well. Uh, it's come out today that Burton might be moving back to the centres. Um, I, I don't really mind it, John. I mean, to be honest, that they haven't got um, they haven't got what they would have wanted out of Burton at this point. Yeah, I always, you know, when he first came to the Bulldogs, I thought it must have been the ultimate scam that Penrith had pulled because 
he was the most sought after player, and then he came to the Bulldogs and he wasn't that good. And I was like, how did they trick every? How did Penrith I've, trick everyone in the league? Have Penrith lost anything without? No, him? that's no. what I mean. Like, the Bulldogs gained anything with him. A really good kicking game sometimes. That's and the, the thing, old like, bomb that's really good. I thought that's, that's what I why I thought like was this the ultimate trick that Penrith had pulled on the rest of the league? Yeah. And yeah. tricked everyone into thinking yeah, that right. Matt Burton is so better than he is. Yeah. Um, him moving back to the centres means you do lose the kicking, which you cannot. Nobody can deny that his uh, high kicking game is is one of the best in the league. Can you still? But could you, you still maybe use his bombs even in the centres? Could sometimes. he come into first or second receiver and still put the yeah, bombs up? So you'll he'll because he'll touch the ball less. He'll go from touching the ball fifty times a game to mm-hmm. fifteen twenty. Unless they purposely um, put him in positions to receive it for kicking. The problem with that is that becomes a set play that other teams can video and read, you know. So there's that danger. Unless they have good... Unless they have a good number seven and number six and nine around a play like that, like I'm going to pass it to my centre to kick, right? Unless you have a good number seven who can identify that the opposing team has identified this and needs to change the play on the fly. Mm. It's not a good idea. There's a, it was a really, in 2011, when the Dragons went on their slide, there was a really good discussion on the footy show, um, or the Sunday race, I can't remember which one, mm. with um, Andrew Johns was talking about, like, um, the most telling stat about the Dragons slide was there was, like, three games in a row where Jamie Soud and Ben Hornby, between them, only ran the ball once. Mm. And then... Andrew Voss said, like, why is that a stat? You know, like, that's what they used to do. He's a good reporter. He'd ask, like, why is that a concern? Mm. And Andrew John said, the key to a good halves player is, first you run the ball. If you can't run the ball because there's nowhere to run, then you pass the ball. If you can't pass the ball, then you kick the ball. Mm. So if they're not running ever, it means they're not identifying when they should run, which means they're not actually identifying when they should pass, which means they're not identifying when they should kick. Mm. So running, like, obviously they, it's, it's based on metres and line break assists. There's the other one. That, like, if the player is gonna, half is going to run the ball, they need to get, be getting line break assists as well or line breaks in themselves. But, yeah, like, so back to the Matt Burton moving to the centres. If mm. they create a play in which Matt Burton is going to kick... They need a halfback and a 5'8 who know when to run the ball. Because if they create that shape, Matt Burton's going to kick the ball and put up a massive bomb and we're going to chase it. Mm -hmm. The opposing team identifies and moves to shut it down. The halfback then needs to identify that the opposing team has identified and probably run the ball. Mm. You know, so Mm. that's what happens when you put a centre as a kicker. There was a period of time again with the Dragons where Gaznia was shifting between 5'8. Centre and fullback, it was the dumbest thing in the world. It was when Nathan Brown was the coach. And really quickly, teams identified the shapes and shut it down. And mm. at the time, their halves weren't creative enough to correct it. Mm. And so that's what that comes down to. Mm. Um, what I also hear is Steve Crichton. Stephen Crichton is definitely playing fullback. Okay. Uh, so that Bulldogs picture is becoming a bit clearer, John. And actually, I don't. I like the idea that they've got to move Burton into the centres. I, th- I think it's a good way of thinking. Um, so obviously, we don't know... Um, obviously, this Jerome Luai is clearly the, the best half of the off-contract players. So, obviously, we th- this player the Bulldogs have in mind is an under-contract player at another club, yeah. and we don't know who it is yet. That's why you wouldn't be hearing about it, right? Yes. So, yeah. yeah, obviously. So, they, they've identified the number seven that they want. It's not mm. Jerome Luai because Jerome Luai wants to play seven, apparently. Um, and so, but that, that leaves Jerome Luai wide open for the Dragons. Um Joey Manu, another thing is Joey Manu definitely isn't leaving the Roosters. Uh, hasn't been announced yet, but it's definite um, that he'll definitely be staying. That I got through a friend right. or a friend. Right, OK. Um, so, yeah, okay. um, one of those text message sharings. <laughs> so you don't know how truthful it is or whatever. Yeah, okay. but, um, so, it does, like again, that leaves, you know, I talked about before, either Joey Manu or Jerome Luai need to resolve Joey Manu, it's within like days basically. Joey Manu will be staying at the Roosters, will be announced, mm-hmm. which means the Dragons will move their offer over to Jerome Luai, give him the option to play seven and probably captain the team, I would say. Boot Ben Hunt, uh, let, sorry, let Ben Hunt go. Uh, ben Hunt will go to the Titans. That'll trigger everything else. 
Put it this way, if I was Jerome Luai, I wouldn't go to the Tigers. I, oh, I would not do it. Don't do it, Jerome. Don't do it to your career. I wouldn't go to the Tigers even for like $1.8 million because... I mean, to be honest, I'd like to see him go there, John. I think it'd be great for the Tigers and it's... great for the competition if he went there because I want to see the Tigers, you know, back up. Well, I always John. want to see I, everyone do well yeah, sometimes. I, 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 I want it to happen, John, but I, I don't think... He should do it for, for himself. He should identify, and if people around him have good yeah. advice for him, they should identify that you're going to go there on a big contract, big money contract, $1.3 million, whatever the bugger Tigers are offering you, with a rookie coach, you learning a new, new re- gaining new responsibility and basically learning a new position if they're giving you the halfback spot is too much for one team in one year. Mm. You know, it's way too much with Benji Marshall as the new unproven coach, Jerome Luai as the new unproven halfback and the new unproven chief playmaker with no support. Mm. Like, you talk about the Knights spine. Willie Mason talks about the Knights spine not being good. What have the Tigers got? They've lost Luke Brooks. Mm. If they hadn't have lost Luke Brooks, I think Jerome Luai going to the Tigers would have been, like, a little bit more attractive. Obviously on overs as well, like, getting paid overs but a little bit more attractive. But now what have the Tigers got? Mm. Yeah, it's not and a good idea. John, maybe Ivan Cleary has a point about Luai. Maybe he's right. Maybe Luai has his role at Penrith that works really well for him, but he's not tested as the chief playmaker at a club. He's protected in a lot of ways by Cleary at Penrith. Cleary's the dominant playmaker. It frees Luai up. He doesn't have the stress of being the chief playmaker. When you're the tri- chief playmaker, it's a lot more stressful than if you play second fiddle yeah. off a dominant playmaker. Luai doesn't have that stress at Penrith with Cleary there with him. He will have that stress with him if he goes to another club and he is the chief playmaker. Maybe he needs to listen to his coach, John. Yes, he'll be on less money at Penrith than another club, but he'll still be on damn good money, John. Um, and he'll, I, th- he'll, I think you're happier in a winning team, John, than you are in a struggling team, even though you get paid more money. Unless he needs to think about this stuff. Unless he you're needs... Aiden Fanua Blake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, need, he needs to make a considered decision here, John. Yeah, it's, it's going to come down to... Um... Now, I'm not disparaging player managers, but player managers' my only goal is to get the most money for their player, not to get them into a winning team. Or exactly. Like that. So you've got to be wary of their agenda. They want that. They don't. They don't. Man, managers only care about money. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's so, their one job. Yeah. So yeah. So they only care about the dollar value of your contract if you're a player. Yeah. They do not care about anything else. I, so I would, players have to be mindful. Of I would that. love to have him at the uh, Dragons. Come to the Dragons. Do it. I'm happy to get well, rid of Ben Hunt. A manager doesn't care if his player's not that happy on huge money. The manager's taking his commission yeah. from the contract. Well, That's all he cares about. The only thing the manager's going to do if you're not happy at, a, at your current club... Is try and find more money at yeah. another club. And so it'll still and, be about the money. Try and find a way to move you to another club in which the old club continues to pay your salary so you can move for more money to another yeah, club. Yeah, and yeah, get yeah. Back yeah. And then the manager still, will get more. It's still about money. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Um, continue, John. Uh, Jerome Law, I watch... Uh, I think the next few days, like, rugby league's over, you know. There's no more rugby league until February. Uh, they're about to go on their second run of holidays, you know, for the Christmas. It's only, like, one or two weeks. I think there'll be the resolution within the next few days. Um, on Lua? On all of them, basically. Okay, all, all gonna, so that's something to keep an eye on. It's all going to, like, start collapsing now. It can't can't keep dragging on. Um, so now we've got... Yeah, Paul, um, Kent. Paul Kent, John. Um, he's been... Um, police have upgraded a charge against him in the lead-up to a court hearing. Um, yeah, these are domestic violence accusations against the rugby league journalist, John. Um, he's pleaded not guilty on assault and choking charges stemming from an alleged altercation at a home in Sydney's Inner West in May. Um, yeah, so... John, obviously... Um, I think he's got a hearing, I think it's next next month, yes, next month he's got a hearing. So, um, John, obviously Paul Kent's entitled to his day in court, these are only charges, he hasn't been found found guilty of anything, and, he's, he's, not guilty. And, and, and he's entitled to the presumption of innocence, like anybody else in this scenario. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just, 
you get in this situation, John, and as a journalist, he was often critical of people who had off-field indiscretions. And when this sort of thing happens, there's part of you that sort of goes, well, you know, that's why you've got to be careful being so critical of other people because when you find yourself in that situation, it doesn't look too good, John. As I say, only charges, not being found guilty of anything, entitled to the presumption of innocence, but he's got to face up to the law well, now, John. Maybe he will learn... Uh, that presumption of innocence is more important than a good headline, you know? Like, that's the thing that uh, all journalists should take away from Paul Kent's situation. Uh, they should promote presumption of innocence more, especially if it comes out that he is not guilty. He's then got to go look at his past and see, like, were there any times where he said something like, Jack DeBellin should be stood down immediately um, and things like that because I'm, I'm all for... Innocent until proven guilty, man. It's it's really like it's my mm -hmm. bag, you know. I, I hate I hate the I've discussed it before. I hate the guilty until proven innocent. I hate that the sporting organisations think that they have a right to restrict income and things like that based on charges just because someone was in a bad situation. I hate that news media organisations do it, and I understand why they have to because people will have looked negatively upon them. You know, people will complain to whatever masthead Paul Kent works for and be like, he shouldn't be writing, he's been charged with uh, domestic violence. But those same people will never come back and go like, oh, sorry, I was wrong, I apologise, when he's found not guilty. So, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, John, we'll see, we'll see what the outcome of this is. I think if he's found not guilty of these charges, I think he should be back in his job. Yeah, 100%. Um, absolutely. And I, I hope that's what happens. That's just a fair... That that would be a fair, you know, outcome. Yeah. But we'll see what we don't know the outcome of this court case, and we will wait and see. Yeah. 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 Um, so just some news, other signing news. Siwa Takiyaho, who is going to go to the Bulldogs and would have been a great signing for them, has not passed the Bulldogs medical, and right. so won't be going. I thought that was a strange one how he'd gone to England and then he was coming back. Um, There's not 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 really many players who go to England and come back and have success. I think he was he was back kind of hunted actually. He was in Catalan at Catalans. Remember Catalans made the final. Um, um, he was going to be getting a two year deal with the team to bring some grunt up front in defence, especially because Takiaho is a big hitter. So he would have been good, like a good couple of years. He's one of those players I've talked about before that's a senior enough player to mm. come in and get the young guys because Bulldogs still do have a very young squad. So um, unfortunately he won't be coming because, yeah, he failed a foot injury test. And Michael Jennings is coming back. Yes. So he's been suspended for three years. Uh, it was that really weird thing where he got suspended before a match. <laughs> for mm. testing neg uh, positive to mm. performance enhancing drugs um, and he's been given a train and trial with the roosters mm. um, yeah been cleared he'll, he'll be doing a train and trial and see how he is. he's like 35 years old uh, I doubt he still have his, has his speed at 35 years old but um, see what happens with Michael Jennings yeah interesting yeah um yeah, that should be. That's the Roosters, isn't it? They're, yeah. they're 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 looking at him again. So he had that success with them winning that premiership in two thousand and thirteen, John. Yeah. So yeah, obviously, I think the Roosters have probably looked at it and gone, you know, um, that they'll get him cheap. Um, yeah. that They'll get him on minimum wage. Um, they he's been at the club before, so they'll know what else. You know, it's not just about what you bring on the field. He might be the player that. He might be, we don't know, John, he might be one of those players in your squad who sets a good example for the younger players. Like Josh, like the Bulldogs, similar to the Bulldogs getting Josh Reynolds exactly. back this year. Um, so that's probably something that the Roosters have thought about, John. Obviously, you know, they're a smart club. They've made a, a considered decision here. Um, and so, look, good luck to him, John. Um, we all love a redemption story. And um, hopefully it goes well there. Yeah, and he... Um yeah, he did win the premiership in 2013. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. hopefully it's a redemption story. Mm. Um, yeah, so on to the AFL. Uh, yeah, the um, draft John, started just, yesterday. Yeah, I was just going to go through I, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, John. But well, a lot of the players, the funny thing about the draft, and always through the draft, is none of the players are famous. 
to anyone except yeah, that, who follow the yeah, sport. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing, John. Um, Har- West Coast had the first pick in the draft this year, and Harley Reid um, has gone to West Coast with that first pick there, John. Um, he's 18 years of age. Um, obviously, you know, you have the players who are touted as the first pick going into the draft every year, and he was touted as it, and, and that's how it's ended up, John. It does, you know... The first pick doesn't always have it their own way. Yeah. That they're, they're, you know that their career doesn't always go the way you expect it to go at that, that young age of, of eighteen. So we'll see what happens with Harley Reid. Good luck, good luck to him, John. Um, yeah. So North Melbourne had second pick. They they went with Tasmanian Colby McKercher. Um, with Gold Coast matching a bid for fellow Allies player Jed Walter at pick number three. So there you go, John. Um, yeah, we don't need to go too yeah. deeply into that. Um, yeah, it's draft finishes tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Oh, yeah, look, I'll be honest. I'm not, not sure on that one. John, I, don't, I don't think it goes for very long. No, no, it's only a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it might, might be the finish yeah. last days today. I can't yeah. remember anyway. But yeah, as yeah. I said, the thing with those draft picks is if you don't follow the sport really deeply, you won't generally know yeah. who yeah. the players are because yeah. they're, they're players that haven't yeah. played before usually. Yeah, I saw a big <laughs> list of picks, John. I wasn't going to read through them. Yeah. I'm not going to bore well, our through, yeah, they all went through their first picks. Um, if you want to see it, go look online. I'm not going to yeah. bore our listeners with it. Um, so just a quick update on the Nikita Zoo fight tomorrow. Yeah. Um, they still they still have – it's the fight is tomorrow – they're still having the back and forth um, between who will work out, Biggs or Sue. Um, so George Rose mm. is actually the oh, owner. Oh, George of, Rose. Yeah, he's the owner of No Limits Boxing. I forgot about that. So No Limits, and he's he said at the press conference that in his opinion, yes, uh, Biggs will have to walk out first because this is the Nikita Sue show. Mm. Uh, it's a bit he's, harsh. He's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's doing quite well in that game, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, George 100%. Rose, yeah. No Limits is one of the Good biggest on boxing organisations in Australia yeah. now. Um and also, they made fun of uh, Michael Zarafa. I don't know what Michael Zarafa is actually doing. He will, um, he was meant to be like our next big thing, but in the end, he, he his fight with um, the other Sue brother, whose name has totally slipped my mind now. Um, they were meant to fight, and then they didn't, and it was out. I haven't heard about Zarafa for ages, but um, he was mentioned in the press conference too. Um, who will probably have to fight? Um, uh, what's his name? Trevor Hardman. Uh, after that, but yeah, it's going to be really interesting tomorrow to see who walks out first, or if they just have this stalemate. We're both. Why can't they both walk out at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> Which music will you play? How will the announcer do it? Like, yeah. this is, it's going to be interesting tomorrow. We'll find out. I, I won't be watching it because I don't want to pay for the pay per view, but I'll I'll probably watch highlights afterwards. And again, it's boxing, so there's not very. That's Isaac Hardman, God damn it! Not very many good fights on the cards. That's just the one, really. Um, It'd be nice if uh, to see a you know a big fight card again. So again, John, my knowledge of uh, the combat sports is nowhere near yours, obviously. But as an outsider, I'd love to see that big card again. That Mayweather McGregor or. Even someone like an Anthony Mundine here, you know, just that real, yeah, that they're... big personality who can sell a big fight. Um, I, the problem is I don't think... It just they're... seems like there's a bit of a, a vacuum there at yeah, the moment. Yeah, there's not, there's not really two. That's the problem at mm. the moment. There's not two fighters across all of the combat sports that are famous enough across all combat sports to have any any care factor for anyone who are in the same weight class. Because the Mayweather-McGregor one is like, Mayweather's world famous to all combat sport followers and a lot of non-combat sport followers. McGregor is world famous to all combat sport followers and a lot of non-combat sport followers. So you get that one. When you have like, um, you know, uh, because they've had some circus shows where it was like Anderson Silva versus... I can't even remember, Roy Jones Jr. or something, who are both greats of their sports, but they're old, man. No one yeah. wants to watch... No one actually wants to watch Robert De Niro fight... Um, what was that movie? Uh, Robert De Niro and Sylvester Stallone oh, were, yeah. were aged, aged boxers that fought oh, each other, came yeah. out of retirement. No one actually wants to watch that, Because Danny Green beat Roy Jones Jr., didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that, but that wasn't that when Roy it Jones... It was like 30 years ago, bro. <laughs> Not that long, but, but, you know... I mean, Roy Jones Jr. was over the hill at that yeah, point, wasn't absolutely. he? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. you know, I mean... It's like nobody wants to watch... There was... 
In MMA, there was, I think, um, Chuck Liddell and Tito Ortiz did a rematch. They're both, like, 48. No one wants to watch that. And, yeah, there's no... So they tried with Engano and Fury, but Engano's not big enough across all combat sports. It was only, actually, UFC... People who watch UFC who are UFC haters that watch that, you know? Like, because Engano had a big falling out with the UFC and all of the people were so... Like, everyone hates the UFC and hates Dana White, blah, blah, blah. And so they loved Engano and so they watched it. But only sold 67,000 pay-per-views because not enough people know who Tyson Fury is and Francis Engano is. People who follow the UFC, even MMA fans, don't really care about Francis Engano. UFC, people who watch the UFC who hate the UFC really care about Francis Engano. Boxing fans like Tyson Fury, but non-boxing fans barely know who he is. They just know he's that big dude you know so there's no one no there's literally no one out there right now that transcends the sports in any combat sports unfortunately a lot of them think they do Israel Adesanya thinks he does Alexander Volkanovsky thinks he does um basically every single uh like Sean O'Malley thinks he does um you know even guys like Deontay Wilder thinks he does Deontay Wilder's gonna go do MMA apparently um <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, cool. He's gonna get leg kicked into oblivion. Like, that's what's gonna happen. He's not gonna. It's gonna. It takes years to learn to, to check calf kicks properly, and somebody's just gonna come a calf kick him and put him down in like one round. Um, you know, Logan Paul and those circus type boxers like Jake Paul and stuff. They think they transcend combat sports, or transcend sports as worldwide personalities. But kids, right? Kids fell in love with that marketing nonsense prime drink that Logan Paul and KSI did. Okay. Mm. Every kid I know, like, you know, I have 11-year-old, I think he's 11, 11-year-old nephew, 9-year-old son who love YouTube. They were really into wanting to get Prime and, and service stations were able to sucker kids into buying Prime for 18 bucks a bottle. You can buy Rick and Woolworths for 4 bucks. Yeah. But they were able to sucker them into it. It tastes like crap. <laughs> yeah. um, and kids wanted to go buy that. But those kids actually don't care about Logan Paul's boxing or KSI's boxing and barely even know they box mm. because they don't transcend the sport to the point where they're world famous as sports personalities, you know. Mm. If they need to... you just got to wait for the next one to, to arrive. Yeah, Floyd Logan, Mayweather was that. Conor Lo- McGregor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Logan Paul clearly doesn't have the profile of Mayweather or McGregor. No. He's just a YouTube sensation, isn't he? Exactly. So for yeah. to kids, right? Yeah. And yeah. like... Uh, MMA and boxing pundits know who he is and his brother Jake Paul and KSI because they keep fighting like ex MMA fighters, mm. old MMA fighters. Like, you know, they fight Anderson Silva, who's retired from MMA and gone to boxing. They'll fight Tyron Woodley, who used to be the UFC champion, lost his last like four matches, retired from MMA and went to boxing and lost a few matches. Like, and, and they're not doing massive pay per views. The, Cards aren't, nobody outside of the sport cares. So we're still waiting, you know. There's like, it, all combat sports go through these lulls. To be honest, Conor McGregor will constantly go on Twitter and say he's coming back. I, I doubt highly that he's ever going to come back. <laughs> it's just beyond ridiculous now. He mm-hmm. says he's doing UFC 300 now, but you know, whatever, bro. Well, at um, least he got the marketing game. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's to, it. As an outsider, John, from what I've heard, I, I know a couple of people who are interested in combat sports. But they say that he's overrated as a fighter, but he sold it, John. He yeah. sold it. People bought in. They'll say that now because um, one of the things about fight the fight game is people will really, really, really pay attention to, like, the most modern thing, you know, like the most up-to-date. So Conor McGregor's won one fight in five years or whatever it is. He has had five fights, four fights, boxing... Um, got be- like broke his leg twice against Dustin Poirier, lost to Khabib, but beat Donald Cerrone. Um, Conor McGregor won two belts across different. He was the first ever UFC fighter to win two belts across two different weight classes. He beat Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo hadn't lost in thirteen years. Mm. He knocked him out in thirteen seconds. You yeah. know he. he, he people would say Conor McGregor is overrated, but the simple fact is he broke Jose Aldo who went on to continue afterwards, and I believe he's retired, I would hope he's retired now. But 
Jose Aldo never got back to his heights. That was his peak. He didn't lose for like 12 or 13 years. Not 12 or 13 fights. 12 or 13 years. And then Conor McGregor knocked him out in 13 seconds. Jose, he beat um, Eddie Alvarez for the, um, the second belt. He was, he was a great champion. He, yeah, he lost some, you know. And people will go on and try and compare him to Khabib. And you've got to look at that even factually. Like, Khabib Nurmagomedov never lost a fight. He only ever lost one round, and it was mm. against Conor McGregor. Mm. It's 29 fights. A lot of his early fights were two-round fights, not three-round fights. And for most other fighters, they don't count on their professional record. So he's 29 and 0. He's actually like a little bit padded. <laughs> I just remember with that Khabib McGregor fight where didn't didn't people sort of jump in yeah. from outside the yeah, so ring? Khabib's, Khabib team, well, yeah. Khabib jumped, left the fence to bash Dylan Dennis. Khabib <laughs> team jumped the fence to bash Conor McGregor. They both cop suspensions. Yeah. But you know you can go because people go on about how Khabib is the great, the goat, and nobody has done 29 and 0. Okay, like nobody in MMA. It's that's a massive achievement even though his record's a little padded, but still a massive achievement either way. Because nobody has gone 29 no, even in with if you discount those amateur fights, man. Like, even if you take out Khabib's amateur fights, go and put in all the other amateur fights in, nobody's done 29 and 0. Mm. Without ever losing a round. But Conor McGregor beat him in one round. You know, if you want to say Conor McGregor is an underrated fighter, tell me one other person who has beat who has won a round, a round against Khabib Nurmagomedov. Oh, you mean overrated, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, yeah, he's yeah, an overrated yeah, yeah, fighter, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're just crazy. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's, it's absolute nonsense. Yeah. And, but uh, people will hate on the teams and hate on the players and hate on the things just because they don't like the, the team, the player. Could like, be tall poppy syndrome yeah, as well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, the guy won two belts. <laughs> he, was a, he didn't defend them, but he was a world champion in two, two weight classes, man. Like, yeah. really, he looked like a skeleton when he fought at the uh, Fort Ho- Jose Aldo. It was kind of gross, but, you know, it's, you have to give credit where credit's due. Yeah, it's yeah, the same with people do. who say, like, yeah. Stipe Miocic isn't the greatest heavyweight of all time. Mm. No other heavyweight in the history of the UFC has won, has defended their title three times. Mm. You have other title defences across different weight classes, like, um, you know, guys like Anderson Silver, I think, is 12. 12 defences. Mm. And it goes down from there, you know, 11, 10, 9, 8, GSP did 6, like these kind of things. So they'll say GSP is the GOAT. Nobody has ever defended more than two times at weight heavyweight because you get punched once and you get knocked unconscious. Stipe did it three times. So therefore, Stipe is the GOAT. Mm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he lost his fourth title defence. Mm. But he still did three. Yeah. So it sounds like you've debunked a couple of common theories. Yeah, yeah, there, but John. it is just tall poppy syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And people will do it the same as they in every sport. Mm. They'll talk about how Djokovic isn't the greatest of all time because Federer is, which we can move yeah. to segue. Yeah, <laughs> even, even though Djokovic now, John, I'm glad you mentioned it, now has won seven ATP finals titles and he's, ecl- he's now eclipsed Federer's six ATP finals titles. So you could really go all day the metrics that Djokovic is ahead of Federer and Nadal on now, John. But anyway, so he beat Yannick Sinner in that final, um, 6-3, 6-3. That was after he lost to Sinner in the group stage, so a nice turnaround from Djokovic there, John. Nick Kyrgios, in his new role as commentator at that tournament, John said, and I quote, Novak Djokovic is obviously superhuman. He is an alien from another planet. So that's, that's an... Uh, that's a nice way of putting it, Nick. Well, 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 well done. Um, so he got yeah. So Djokovic just continues on this reign of dominance in the tennis world, John. Yeah, that it's close, extraordinary. close match against Sinner in the prelim, and then, like I say, he just decided. You know, he just decided he was going to win six three six three. Like he knows when to turn the switch on, John. Oh my God, yeah, he's ridiculous. So now does Fe- so, Roger Federer hold any records? Well, not, no, certainly <laughs> certainly n- none of the obvious ones, John. So Djokovic now has the most Grand Slam titles, which we've talked about, 24, Nadal 22, Federer 20. He has the most weeks at world number one, which we've talked about. I think now he's up to 400 weeks at world number one, John, if you can believe that. Well ahead of Federer and Rafael Nadal in that category. Um, you know, I, I, I could go on and on, John. Well, now, as we say, he's got the most ATP finals wins as well. 
Um, he leads head in the head. If you look at the head-to-head -head records between Djokovic and Nadal and Djokovic and Federer, John, he leads the head -to on the head-to-head -head records, John. So anybody who, and we won't do it today because there's too much on John, but I guess you, you, it really defeats any sort of argument you could make for Federer yeah. or Nadal ahead of Djokovic now. Oh, but anyway. It's like you, read, you read through the records and it's like this. Roger Federer held the record for this and then Djokovic took it. Roger yeah, Federer yeah, that, held that, the record that's for it. and then Djokovic took that's it. it. That's it. That's, that's the story here, John. Um, his dominance just continues on and on. Um, yeah, so that's 55 and 6 that Djokovic has had this year, John. 55 wins and 6 losses in a season. Just extraordinary numbers, John. Extraordinary. Ridiculous. Um, yeah, unbelievable. Um, John, there is um, Davis Cup on yep. this week as well, the Davis Cup finals. Um the main points here, John, yeah, so Australia play the Czech Republic in their quarterfinals, John, um, captained by Leighton Hewitt. Obviously, the team is Alex Demonor, Max Purcell, Jordan Thompson, Tanasi Kokonakis and Matt Ebden. Um, yeah, so it'll be... This will this will all be done in the space. It's, uh, it's different to the old Davis Cup format, as we talked about before, yeah. John. This will all be wrapped up in a week. Australia will play the quarters. If they win, it'll be the semis and the final... Straight after back to back, this will all be done in a week, John. Um, Novak Djokovic himself will be playing in this tournament as well, John, for Serbia. So um, that's the it's main. Going to be played in front of five hundred people in, in a neutral venue. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the main um, point of note is um, Djokovic playing for Serbia here, John. No, yeah. I don't think there's anything else really of note to talk about here. When is it on? Australia, Czech Republic, I believe it's on tonight, John. I believe that that, that match will be played. So, again, we're recording this Tuesday morning. Mm. That, I think, will be played Tuesday night, our time. Yes. Yep, it is. Yep. Okay, cool. Is it on KO? That's probably on KO. Actually, actually, I think, John, and again, I haven't had a chance to look it up, but I think this will probably be on Channel on those back Channel 9 channels, I think. I I'll suspect. Try and find it, but um, yeah. No, if no. not, it'll be on um, B in Sports, and if like me, B in Sports has been wiped from your Foxtel account. Well, you won't be able to see it. What? Unfortunately. Uh, Tuesday, twenty first of November. Where can I watch it? Uh, I don't know. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the American Times. Anyway, yeah, it's on tonight. Um. Other sports news? We got any other sports news? Anything else happened? Uh, my favourite topic, rugby union. Mm -hmm. Something has happened. Yep. Our best friend Hamish McLennan was sacked. Sacked. Gone! Who, who do you think was more on the nose, John? Hamish McLennan or the Optus CEO? <laughs> Probably the Optus CEO uh, because not enough people care about rugby yeah. union. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 10 million people were put out by um, yeah, yeah, the Optus, yeah. uh, Optus failure. 17 were put out by Rugby Australia's failure at the um, World Cup. Yeah. So <laughs> no matter how much he tried to redirect it to um, the blame to Eddie Jones, yeah. um, uh, he's his face is sack after an extraordinary um, board meeting the other night. Um, and uh, I was talking to my rugby union uh, friend. Mm -hmm. I love this. And he was saying, um, you know, I have one guy, I know one guy who's fully into rugby union, played rugby as a kid um, and so on. He, um, he said, actually, he still thinks that Eddie Jones was the guy to, to fix Australian rugby. Um, and he... He thinks Eddie Jones is going to go to Japan and do wonders with Japanese rugby again. The issue came that he was appointed by um, McLennan and then very early in Eddie Jones's tenure, when things weren't going well, Hamish McLennan immediately flipped the script and tried to just put it all on Eddie Jones, mm -hmm. basically threw Eddie under the bus mm -hmm. and there was nothing he could do. So, again, this is all coming from my friend, not, not from me. <laughs> um, mm. But um, if McLennan had have protected Eddie Jones more, then they would have been able to do better at the World Cup. And he's happy that McLennan is sacked. So former Wallaby Dan Herbert has immediately replaced Hamish McLennan. Um, his one goal is to fix Australian rugby in time for the next World Cup. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, good luck with that, brother. Yeah, um, I think it's the right call. John McLennan yeah. had to go. So I agree. I, I, don't, I don't know what they do from here to fix the mess. But that, that's a good start, I think, John. I think, yeah, like I say, just shut down the shut it shut shut it down. They can keep the wallabies up and running, but shut it down, shut it down, just shut it all down. We're shutting it all down. At least then, they've taken the first step, John. Yeah, and now it's about what they do next. Bring back a, a better, more organised competition. Um, um, I was just gonna. I have got a bit of other news myself, yep. John. Continuing on with this theme of the Cricket World Cup, it is a bit of a celebration podcast of Australia's win. So this is a tweet that's resurfaced from Shane Warne, posted on December 6, 2016, and I quote, I'm a big fan of Travis Head as a cricketer. I believe he will be a future star for Australia in all forms of the game. The tweet read, predicting Head's newfound stardom. So there you go, the late, great Shane Warne. Saw it coming, John. I he saw think... into the future like he did with that Herschel yeah. Gibbs in that 99 World Cup, the drop catch. To be honest, I don't think there's ever been anybody who could see cricket as a whole the way Warney... Yeah, well, when, when he was playing in the Big Bash League he went, and he was mic'd up, he predicted wickets he was about to take. Yeah, I mean, that's... He can just see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, amazing. Once again, Travis Head, absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, John, one, one last thing before we wrap up, still on that theme. Uh, that, that was just a, a, an unbelievable victory by Australia. And I just can't help but think, John, that... And we talked about, you know, the, 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 the anthems with the rugby league team and everything. But the 99 team that won the, the Cricket World Cup, John, they, they won it in England. They had a ticker tape parade in Sydney with 100,000 people there, John. And I just can't help but think that if this team, for starters, I doubt this team will get a ticket tape parade in Sydney. And even if they did, John, there's no way that 100,000 people would turn up. No. It's just a real pity that a lot of the passion seems to have gone out of this country and we're not celebrating these big wins it's, like um, we used to. Social media creating self-hate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lack, lack of pat, uh, patriotism and self-hate by Western countries. America sees the same thing. England sees the same thing. It's seriously social media doing it. Um, yeah, they, like, they, they can't come for a ticket tape parade. They're busy playing another series. Yeah. <laughs> like, when are they going to come back? But that's the thing. Even if they did, John, there's no way you get yeah. 100,000 people. That You'd be lucky to get 5,000 yeah, people at a ticket tape parade now. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a la- lack of national pride. It's another John. thing that social media has ruined. Yeah, well, it's pre... Yeah, well... So you think that's the main catalyst? Yes, I do. Yeah, I think social up. media has um, created a Western culture... Western culture. If India had a one, they would have got a billion people in a ticket tape parade. You yeah, because you, you're West- an ex- you're an expert yeah. on social media. It's uh, created a Western culture, self self hating Western culture culture, and it's made it not socially acceptable to support your country in any way, especially in sport. Um, mm-hmm. Social justice warriors and virtue signaling people will denigrate sporting stars as not doing enough to fix the world and support the as world. As if that's their job. Yeah, it's um, not their job to and, fix the you world. You know, they'll say things like, oh, they get paid so much money for running a ball around and then they'll use it as the uh, the platform and example for unequal pay when once again it's got to come down to who generates the most money, gets the most income in a sporting environment. There mm-hmm. are we female sporting organisations in which uh, sporting organisations in which the females get paid more and it's simply because they bring in more money. There are Sporting or sports where women get paid the same because they bring in the same amount of money. And there are where women get paid less because they bring in way less. Mm-hmm. And that's basically, I like to use the, you know, WNBA is like the least watched sport in the world. <laughs> and they always use this, like WNBA, um, you, got, you got NBA players on like $140 million contracts, mm-hmm. like ridiculous money. And you've got WNBA players are the highest paid up up until recently, the highest paid player was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, you know, social justice warriors would go on about how it's an unfair disparity, and then you know you can just say, well, okay, take the same percentage of revenue, because if you took the same percentage of revenue between WNBA and NBA, WNBA players would owe the NBA money. Yeah, they run right, out so of it's about money. the revenue that comes yeah. in, it's and that's that's what social media has done. It's that's what it's turned sport into. And taking away the patriotism in sport. Sport should be about bringing people together 
it always has been about bringing people together. But the social media and the social justice warriors and this virtue signaling has taken that away from everybody, and it's like actually quite sad. And I think, John, I think there's an opportunity for... Like, women make up 52% of the... You've always got to be careful when you talk about these things, but women make up 52% of the population. There's a real opportunity for them to get behind women's sport more, sign up to your local team, join your team, become a member, go to the games, build up the crowds... I think that, that, that there is that opportunity, the John, if I'm allowed to say that. Yeah, yeah, women's rugby, I keep saying, women's rugby league is, is very vastly different. Uh, the w, NRL, NRLW, vastly different to how it was just a few years ago. Where, like, one game I went to this year, all of the people knew all the girls' names, all of the, like, little boys, little mm-hmm. girls running down to take photos with the female players. It shows that there is the ability, you know... Um, uh, this year there's been next for next year or something there's been an increase in funding to the NRLW where the players will be getting paid more a bunch of them being able to lose their full time jobs and you know who, who doesn't complain about inequality in payments the NRLW players because mm. <laughs> they know that they're they are actually part of building something yeah and we should say that the the, the standard of the NRLW has been great yeah, this year absolutely. it started it's out terrible just, like yeah, honestly but it, I mean everything <laughs> everything builds yeah, right it's so good I'll be watching it a lot more yeah. next year. Yeah. I watched the girls' internationals, and they were better than some of the men's internationals. Yeah, I think undoubtedly, John, I, I think the quality of the NRLW is it, it's better than the AFLW yeah, so at, the, at this point, John. I, I think, think the NRLW, it, it's real good quality footy. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Com- the, comparis- the, the comparison between men and women's in NRLW versus AFLW is the NRLW quality of game is better, mm. and I think it's a better run competition. I do. I just really do. I love the way it's at the same time. I love the way they get the grand final on the same day. I can't wait till it's... How many teams are there now? 17 teams. 17 NRLW teams, and you can go to every single match, and I can watch the NRLW team first. I can't wait for these days. Um, Yeah, so... That's unfortunate. I would love to go to... I would go to a parade for this round, cricketers. Um, Social media comments this week. Um, so if you remember, we I talked about uh, my Facebook friend Paul, uh, who talked about when New Zealand beat Australia in the final, and his comments about how Origin is no longer the pinnacle, and New Zealand is about New Zealand is now better than Origin, blah blah. And I sent him a, as the snippet, mm-hmm. so he had a bunch of comments. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Got a bit sparked up. He said, uh, "We never actually answered this question," which, as I said to him. I sent him a less than minute snippet to mention the fact that we mentioned this thing and he could go listen to the podcast to see the whole thing. Um, and then we, we diverted quickly to Fiji versus PNG. And it's okay to admit the uh, that origin is no longer the pinnacle. Um, and the Australian excuse machine of blaming complacency where the actual truth is about 10 Kiwis would walk into your pinnacle origin teams. Now... There are a bunch of Kiwis in the Origin teams, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, John, I think, I mean, I've got to say, I I sort of, I mean, the, the issue for Australia was they didn't pick the right play. It wasn't that New Zealand were that much better that, than them. It was that Australia didn't pick the right players in this tournament. They picked Tedesco ahead of Reese Walsh, Kalen Ponga, which just shouldn't have happened, yeah. John. That was the problem for Australia. It wasn't, I, I'd... I'd Looking at it on paper, I don't think that 10 Kiwis walk into Origin teams. I, I don't can't think... Th- who are these 10 Kiwis? It, 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 it doesn't happen, John. Who are the they, 10 Kiwis? They beat an Australian team that got complacent, that got lazy, that that picked players on reputation, not on form this year, and they paid the price. In terms of talent, Australia is still far outweighs New Zealand, I, John. But because New Zealand have far more national pride... Love their jumper, bleed for their jumper, cry for their jumper, show emotion for their jumper. Um, that's why New Zealand got that win, John. It wasn't playing talent on paper and no 10 Kiwis gonna, would, would not walk into Origin. Two. I wish Facebook had a remind script. Like Reddit has a remind script where you can comment on something and say remind it and tell it when and it will come back to you and send you a notification in that amount of time because I'd love to do a reminder. I'm going to remember next year if Australia beat... Well, when Australia, when Australia win the Pacific Championship next year, what my good friend Paul is going to say. <laughs> I want to know who these 10 players are. What are the 10 players that could walk into an Origin jersey? Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of forwards uh, that wouldn't be out of place, I think. Nelson and Safa Salomona plays for New Zealand, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like he, he's, a, he's a player who could play Origin. But there are other props ahead of him, actually. 
So, John, if, hypothetically, if New South Wales, Queensland, and this actually happened back in the Super League days, but if New South Wales, Queensland and New Zealand played a tri-series, where do you think New Zealand would finish? Third. I agree. <laughs> so I think that sums it up, Third. doesn't it? Third. Yeah. Um, Australia but... got complacent, got lazy, was thinking about their holidays to Bali or Vegas. And that's and they got their pants pulled down by New Zealand yeah. in that form. I can't wait to um as I said, I can't wait till next year. I made a quite heap funny comment on Reddit recently. This is where I learned about the remind script where I said like um someone was asking about like uh, why do blue belts in Jiu Jitsu think they know everything? And I said like uh, belt, the belt system in Jiu Jitsu is like life. A twenty year old thinks they know everything until they turn twenty five and realise they don't know everything and then now they do and then when they turn thirty they realise they didn't know everything and now they do and when they turn thirty five belts in jujitsu is like that. White belt thinks they know everything till they get to blue belt, don't know everything, purple and so on. And I said it's only when you get to my age that you realise you know everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then some guy replied, remind in five years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't wait for five years to be up. Yeah, um, you don't know until you know, right? Yeah, John? exactly. That's the way it is. Um, and then on Twitter, this is our first ever Twitter comment. Uh, and it's actually thanks to our sponsorship of Club Prairie Fire who tag us and we get a lot of uh, Club Prairie Fire blowback, which is awesome. Mm. Um, after the... Uh, post about Australia winning the World Cup. Said, fair play, Australia from the Barney, uh, Barmy Army. Thanks for the comment, Colonel Junior. Um, yep. Thanks, uh, Colonel Junior. I think Barmy Army actually did do a um, a comment congratulating Australia. Um, and Dave Warner replied, I did hear a great um, uh, piece of commentary this morning on the rush hour on the way to work um, in which... I think it was Mick Malloy said um, these Cricket World Cups are really good because you get to see the Minnow teams like Afghanistan, Netherlands and England play against the top teams in the world. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um, so before we head off, uh, again, congratulations, Alan Wood, on winning the cricket competition that's now over. We'll have a new competition up and running soon. Don't forget the, sub- the Subversion Ascension. Uh, Subversion Ascension will be next week. On Saturday, greatest jiu-jitsu event in Australia. The ADCC trials is on this week and a bunch of the guys who will feature on Subversion Ascension will be in Singapore trying to con- qualify for ADCC. Josh Saunders and Bob Frias, who are going for the heavyweight title. Josh Saunders is actually running a seminar the day after ADCC trials. He's <laughs> named it How I Won Yesterday. <laughs> 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 is, but it's already like up so there's a bit of confidence there that Saunders will win um, d- don't forget to listen to Club Prairie Fire it's still ongoing just because the World Cup's over doesn't mean Club Prairie Fire ends it's got some great commentary oh great so it's continuing yeah. after the- oh great um, okay. and then don't forget to follow at Smart B app mm. on all of our social medias and subscribe yep. to us on YouTube and yep. like our I'm, videos yeah I was just going to say John um, now that the Cricket World Cup's over um there is still plenty more coming up. Um, the, the Big Bash starts on December 7, yep. John. That's not far away. That's just around the corner. Australia's Test Series against Pakistan starts on December 14 as well. We've got three tests against Pakistan and then two against the West Indies around the corner. So, yeah, there's plenty more coming up, even though the Cricket World Cup's done. Plenty more cricket just around the corner, John, even though no one cares about this T20 Series against India. I only care about the World Cup. Why are we playing T20s? Yeah, um, yeah. There's always sport. Never mind. 100, 365 days a year, literally mm-hmm. there is sport. Yes. Um, yeah, Big Bash yeah. League. I'm really pumped for it and hopefully I'm going to get some tickets. Oh, um, yeah, cool. And go watch my team, the Sydney Sixers. Nice one. All right. Uh, so Thanks. see everybody on Thursday. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Bye, Producer John. Bye.